can we can start okay om ajnana tamarandasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshur militanne tasmay shri gurave namaha Vanchaka upatarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhai evacha patitanam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our second session on this uh, study of the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, let me share the screen here. Oh, wait. Just a minute. Okay. Okay, let's just review what we covered in the last class. We explained the connection between cantos one and two. Yeah, everyone remember the, co the connection between the two cantos? Someone can tell me? Yes, Maharaj. So, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, in end of canto one, Parikshit Maharaj asked uh, two questions to uh, uh, Subdev Goswami, and that is the beginning of canto two. What did he ask? He asked that uh, 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 what should be the uh, aim of uh, persons uh, who is uh, uh, on the deathbed. What should be the aim? Maharaj, what is the duty of the person who is about to die? Okay. It's better. Yeah. What is the, and what is the duty of all people at all time? All right. And he also wanted to know what should one hear, chant and remember. All right. So these questions are answered in the course of uh, the other, other cantos. So we showed the overview of the second canto and then study of this unit, which we're looking at, the first five chapters. The essence of Sukadev Goswami's answer to Maharaj Pariksit's question. Summarize the essence <laughs> described here in a very simple way. Never forget Krishna and always remember Krishna. That you could say that's the essence of Sukadeva Goswami's answer to Maharaj Parikshit. He spoke about uh, Maharaj Parikshit, uh, Sukadeva Goswami rather spoke about the condition of materialistic people, how they're very attached to their sense gratification and they have no time to hear about Krishna. 
and then in relation to mood and mission, the following phrases reflect Srila Prabhupada's mission. Lokahitam, Lokahitam in the very first verse of the this fir first chapter of the second canto, it was described that these questions, these questions which Maharaj Parikshit had asked, they are beneficial to all the people of the world because people all over the world, they need to have this kind of knowledge, they need to have this kind of education. They're lacking in this education to understand the real mission of human life and how to make proper use of the human form of life. So his questions, Maharaj Pariksit's questions were very much appreciated by Sukadeva Goswami that was beneficial for people everywhere. And remember we spoke about how people benefit, that the person who asks the questions benefit, and the person who replies, who answers the question, he's benefited, and the audience who hear, they're all benefited. So everyone is benefited. And then apashyatam atmatatvam. Apashyatam meaning they're blind to the, the goal of atmatatva, meaning the science of the soul. So Krishna consciousness movement. The Krishna consciousness movement is meant for this purpose. meant to get people to understand this Atma Tattva. We want to open people's eyes and let them see what is the real goal of the human life. We don't want them to waste their valuable time. We want them to make proper use of this human life and understand Krishna consciousness. So these two the phrases are very much related to Srila Prabhupada's mission. He, Prabhupada had a lot of compassion for the world and he thought how to deliver them. And that's why he wrote his books and that's why he traveled and preached and why he set up the Krishna consciousness movement out of compassion for all of these people. All right, so that's mood and mission. And then Shastra Chaksus discuss the Bhagavatam's description of materialistic life, right? Materialistic life, how people are very much absorbed in their own sense gratification, all just based on the animal propensities, eating and sleeping and mating and defending. And they, they work very hard to make money and they use all the money simply for sense gratification. They don't know how to use their hard-earned wealth for spiritual advancement. They will simply spend it all for sense gratification. They'll eat forbidden, forbidden foods and they'll watch, you know, in, a, in, in inappropriate movies. They'll hear from all the wrong sources. So materialistic life is the blind following the blind. People conditioned souls all busy in the matter of sense gratification and simply wasting their valuable life. Then we did speak about some personal application. We spoke about uh, Nama Parad and how we can improve our chanting. I hope you all managed to wake up earlier this morning and do more chanting before before uh, bef before it gets too too late. Early take advantage of or even turn it off. And this way help us to absorb ourselves more in the holy name. 
and then a plan how to create a favorable lifestyle for chanting a plan for favorable lifestyle good association try to come to the morning program in the temple whenever you can hmm. and try to uh, make sure we get some chanting done in the early morning identify the qualities of an ideal hearer of Bhagavatam the ideal hearer you, you'll hear with rapt attention uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati when he gave an initiation to our own founder Acharya Bhaktivinanta Swami Prabhupada at that time he said oh yes I have noted him he does not go away so that's an important qualification of a hearer that they will stay in here they don't go away and they'll hear submissively and they'll ask also intelligent questions like that these kind of quali qualities are good for the ideal hearer of Bhagavatam then preaching application the example of Sukadeva Goswami as an impersonalist being attracted by the transcendental pastimes of the Lord uh, how he became a devotee so that's uh, Sukadeva Goswami he, we said he had been in the womb of his mother for uh, 16 years but when he heard Srimad Bhagavatam he was attracted and he came out and hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, he, he developed a, an attraction for devotional service. And previously, he'd been fixed on the impersonal Brahman. But through hearing the pastimes of the Lord, he was attracted to take up devotional service. So this is the power of the, the hearing process. If people are given a chance to hear about the pastimes of the Lord, then it can change the hearts, even of the hard-hearted impersonalists, they can become devotees. So this was a preaching application. Uh, are there any questions on any of the, or one more evaluation? The application of the guidelines for dealing with blasphemy in a contemporary context. So, the guideline for dealing with blasphemy is avoid it, get away from that place immediately. If, if we're not able to effectively counter whatever people are saying, then just get away from that place. Don't stay in here. Don't give people more room for blasphemy. So, better to just avoid these kind of people altogether. So that is a suitable method of uh, avoiding that kind of situation. Just keep away, keep out of sight, out of get out of the place. You don't want to be around where there's a lot of this kind of prajalpa and blasphemy going on. All right, so are there any questions on any of these points which we covered yesterday? Anyone? Okay, then we'll go ahead. Maharaj, there was a point made better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. Yes. So? Maharaj, I wanted to ask uh, some uh, more examples in this from the Bhagavatam, like uh, on substantiating the statement. Well, Srila Prabhupada gives an example. He says uh, Shankaracharya was in this world for only 32 years, but he made a great contribution. Right? He made a great contribution by his preaching and his writing also. He defeated Buddhism and 
established the, he brought the Vedas back, restored the Vedic path. So he was only in the world a short time, but his contribution was very significant. And similarly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in this world only for 48 years, but he also made a very significant contribution to the world in his time here. So he gave those examples. You know, I said, you know, trees may live a long time, but they don't have much consciousness. And so in this way you can understand it's not so much the time which you're here, but it's what you do it with your time. And so Katvanga Maharaj was the example that he fixed his mind on the Lord and he got success in a moment. So Sukadeva Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit and he's encouraging all of us that, you know, we should take up this Krishna consciousness and make the best use of even a short time. You know, Ajamila is also there at the end of life, he took up Krishna consciousness. And similarly, the Goswami, like Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, they were not young men when they retired to Vrindavan and wrote the, the books which they did and excavated the holy places. But in that short time, they made very significant contributions. Is that all right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. All right. So, continuing here. Someone like to read this overview for us, the first one? Chapter 1, Overview. Verses 14 to 21. Shukadev Goswami recommends detachment from material life. One should leave home and practice self-control in a sacred place. One should chant the Pranav Mantra, Omkar, and the mind will become progressively spiritualized. Thereafter, by meditation on the form of Vishnu, come to the level of devotional service. Verses 22 to 39. Shukadev Goswami describes meditation on the gross universal form of the Lord because there is nothing more than this in the material world. One who does not concentrate his mind upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead will be misled and will cause his own degradation. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Manaji. All right, so these are the two sections which we want to cover still here in this first chapter. Uh, so, looking at the what is actually happening here, Sukadeva Goswami in 1621, as we heard, Sukadeva Goswami was encouraging Maharaj Parikshit to detach himself and to renounce all connections with the material world. So Sukadeva Goswami describes renunciation and also he describes a mechanical process of meditation for neophytes. We, he's going to describe uh, meditation on the Omkara mantra. He's, mm, he's mentioned here, this is for, for neophytes. You have to understand that uh, Tsukadeva Goswami was speaking to an assembly of people there. Although Maharaj Parikshit was the main focus of his attention, there was an assembly of people here. So Sukadeva Goswami began his uh, process of self-realization, the process of renunciation by speaking about meditation on this omkara, the mechanical process. And then after explaining that, then text 22 to 25, Sukadeva Goswami will describe the process of meditation on the universal form, which is uh, 
what we would call the, the pantheist, pantheistic approach to see the universe as a representation of God for people who are not able to understand the Lord in a transcendental form, such as the deity, then they can meditate on the universe as being a form of the Supreme. And that's described 26 up to 38. We'll hear about this conception of the Virata Rup, or this gigantic form. All right, now here, that, uh, referring to text number 15, text number 15, speaking about desire. Would someone like to read this section for me? One must have a chance for better desires. Otherwise, there is no chance of giving up such morbid desires. Desire is the concomitant factor of the living entity. The living entity is eternal and therefore his desires, which are natural for a living being, are also eternal. One cannot therefore stop desiring, but the subject matter of desires can be changed. So one must develop the desires for returning back home, back to Godhead, and automatically the desires for material gain, material honor, and material popularity will diminish in proportion to the development of devotional service, Srimad Bhagavatam 2.1.15. All right. So we have to purify our desires. We, the nature of the mind is to desire. So we cannot stop desire. As mentioned here, it's a concomitant factor of the living entity. It's going to be there. Desire is going to be there. But the quality of desire can be changed. As mentioned, we are eternal and his desires are also eternal. So we have to understand, we can't just stop, don't like the impersonalists say, try to negate desire to stop all desire. They want to make the mind blank. But our process is not to make the mind blank, but to purify the desire. Mm. We want to develop the desire, as mentioned there. We want the desire to go back home, back to Godhead. We want to become absorbed in that thought, and become eager to go back to Godhead. We want to be have the desire to give Krishna consciousness, to preach Krishna consciousness, and to see the world take up Krishna consciousness. So we should have that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of dedication shown here. Right, you can see the devotee giving a book to this materialistic person and the, the man saying, what about those who, are, for various reasons, are not able to chant? You know, we may be preaching to people, you should chant the holy name. And so the man is asking, well, what about people who are not able to chant? And definitely there are people like that. They're not able to chant. So those who are not able to chant the name as recommended can chant pranav omkara. This mechanical process for tra training of the mind will lead to self-realization. Oh, some years ago I had the experience, uh, I was teaching an introductory class on yoga and most people to chant Hare Krishna, they, they, they objected. Some of them objected. Some of the members in the class, they said, no, 
I'm not going, this is, this is a, 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 I'm a Catholic. You know, they said, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian or I'm a Catholic. We don't chant Hare Krishna. This is some Hindu God. We're not going, I'm not going to chant it. So you ask them to chant Hare Krishna and they have some impressions about it. But if you ask them to chant Om, <laughs> somehow they don't mind, you know. You don't get much object. Nobody usually objects if you ask them to chant Om. So that, that's something which sometimes happens, you know, in presenting Krishna consciousness. So because our Krishna consciousness movement has some recognition, people have heard of it, the problem comes up, you know, people are opposed to it. But if you ask them to chant Om, then, you know, that's a more general thing. People are not so opposed to that. <laughs> so, mentioned here also that people were not able to chant six, the 16 words of the Hare Krishna mantra, then let them chant Om. And this is a, a process by which they can train the mind and help them to become self-realized. However, meditation on the limbs of the form of Vishnu is better than the impersonal Omkara meditation. Mediation. So, meditation on the limbs of the form of Vishnu. This, we're going to speak about this, about this kind of conception how to realize the Lord in this way, the different limbs of the Lord, and the form, and that, that is better than simply meditating on the impersonal omkara, which people, which some people do do. Uh, from text number 19, of this chapter mentioned there that foolish persons bewildered by the external energy of Vishnu don't know that the ultimate goal of the progressive search after happiness is to get in touch directly with Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead. So, every, people are looking for happiness. You can see in the picture on the side there, uh, uh, people are looking for happiness, they're looking to the money, they're thinking that it's going to solve their problems and give them the happiness they want. They're thinking this is a way to find real pleasure in the world, right? So, to transform the adverse desires of the jivas is the supreme duty of the most merciful. To rescue one person from the stronghold of Mahamaya is an act of superb benevolence. You need a lot of mercy to do this, to give Krishna consciousness to people, to try to bring them out of the material world to bring them to the platform of self-realization, to help them to understand their real self. Okay, so here you can see uh, we're introducing this concept of this pantheism. Pantheism, sometimes uh, pantheism is also described as the concept of having many gods. But here, in talking about pantheism, Srila Prabhupada is describing the concept of seeing the world as God. So it's mentioned there, the neophyte impersonalist is given a chance 
to realize the relation of the Lord in everything by the philosophy of pantheism. So this is, of course, not for devotees, but this is for neophyte impersonalists, someone who doesn't have much appreciation, doesn't have any appreciation for spiritual science. So they're impersonal. They're only a little bit above materialistic people. They're actually offenders to the Lord. And they have this idea. They want to be self-realized, but how to do it? So this philosophy of pantheism is there. It gives people a chance to purify their consciousness, that they can gradually come to recognize that there is a person behind the universe. So initially, they have to think of the universe itself in a personal way. This is the idea. So, this uh, text, uh, this section we were discussing earlier, remember, 14 to 21, Sokadeva Goswami is describing about detachment. So he's describing meditation on the Omkara, meditation and renunciation. Right? So it's come it's very similar uh, to astanga yoga the astanga yoga process which you studied in the sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita so here you can see also the different stages which are being described here in this process of renunciation sukadeva goswami was describing different stages by which Maharaj Parikshit and others could renounce the world. And the first thing he mentions, he talks about Brahmacharya. And so this is the stage of Yama. Yama, sense control. You know, the Astanga Yoga system begins with Yam and then Niyam. So the first stage is practicing Brahmacharya life, giving up connection with the other sex. And then the second thing, niyam. First were things you shouldn't do, and then second things which you have to do. And so there was pro prohibitions and then regulations. Second thing, regulation, bathing in holy places, bathing in the holy rivers. So that's like the second stage of the Astanga Yoga. That is like the Niyam. Sukadeva Goswami had mentioned Brahmacharya, bathing in the holy rivers. And then he mentioned also the third thing. He talks about the asana, the sitting place, that you should have a seat, or you should have a deerskin and a cloth. So the, the third stage of uh, the yoga process is asana. Yam, niyam, asan. So you make a seat, a seat for yourself, and sit on the deer skin with the straw, kusha grass, and a deer skin, and then put a cloth over it, and you sit there. So that's the third stage of the Astanga Yoga. And then, Chanting the three syllables combined as Om repeatedly. This is the pranayama. Chanting Hare Krishna, of course, is also pranayama. You could consider the chanting of Hare Krishna also to be a type of pranayama. So three syllables, A, U, M this om so that is the the pranayama which is the fourth stage in that astanga yoga process yeah yam niyam asan pran, pranayam 
and then Next, Pratyahara, Pranayam, oh, there should be Dharana, and then Pratyahara, many Pratyahara, or oh, Pratyahara, Dharana, Pratyahara, yeah, pra, Pratyahara, fifth stage, by the controlled mind, sorry, by the controlled mind, one should withdraw the senses, such such as the eye and ear from the sense objects such as sound. This is the fifth stage, pratyahara. So you can see the process of concentration and meditation by the controlled mind. Take the senses, withdraw the sense of the eye and the ear from the sense object the eye, take the, the object which is absorbing the eye, detach the eye from that object and the ear, don't listen to the sound, don't worry about the sound. So like this pratyahara, detaching the senses from the objects, the eye, the object of the eye, the, 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 the sense objects, the sight, so detach the eyes from it and similarly with sound don't become absorbed in the sounds around you so this kind of stage of meditation is described as the fifth stage and then the mind whose assistant is the intelligence which discriminates should then concentrate with intelligence on the form of the Lord. This is the sixth stage of dharana. So, pratyahara dharana, the sixth stage. The mind assisted by the intelligence. Concentrate with intelligence on the form of the Lord. So, you have to have some knowledge, the form of the Lord. You have to be able to fix your mind in that way on the form of the Lord. Then only you can, then only you can understand. And then this, the seventh stage, dhyana is described. One should meditate on the individual limbs of the Lord. So the meditation becomes concentrated onto the limbs of the Lord. And then the final stage of the Astanga Yoga, the Samadhi. Engage the mind without contact with sense objects. Don't think of anything else. This is the Brahman, the form of the Lord in which the mind is pacified. So in this way, the, the Astanga Yoga process is completed in the practice of uh, yoga, Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Mishra Yoga. There's some devotion there in the practice of yoga. So Sukadeva Goswami is mentioning to Maharaj Parikshit that you can do this kind of meditation. He was telling him to chant Om and in this way renounce the world. And then he goes on to describe about contemplating the universal form. So we'll see how to contemplate. First of all, 
we want to give you a little opportunity for discussion. So a question is raised. If Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee, why is he presenting the process of mystic yoga beginning with meditation on the Virat? Because there are many audience. The, the, all the audience are not the devotees. They are, they are impersonalist devotees and the personalist devotees are mixed. So it was for all of them. Okay. Anybody else? Anything? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj. Um, Parikshit Maharaj Ashukdev Goswami. What is the way of perfection for all the persons? Because he asked for all the persons, that is why for all people, Shukdev Goswami is answering. Okay, good. Yeah. So everyone should do this, you mean? Uh, You're saying for everyone, for all. So this is for everyone. This is for the neophytes who cannot, who can, who do not have the faith on the DT form. This is for the neophytes. This is for the impersonalists as well. Well, shouldn't have, shouldn't have begun, shouldn't he have begun with the devotional process? And then when people said, well, I can't do that, then we give them some alternative. Because the question was for the all kinds of people, all kinds of people. Maharaj, when we were doing Bhakti Shastri, we had to write a question on yoga ladder. So during that time also, we, we went from Ashtanga step by step to all the yogas and then we went to Bhakti Yoga. So if we tell them about, tell somebody about Bhakti, they will not, they will take it very cheaply. But when they understand, when they will go step by step, then they can realize better. This is my understanding. Okay, very good. Yes, nice. Yeah, I also understood that when the um, uh, when Krishna explains it in the Bhagavad Gita, he explains the Astanga Yoga so that then he could then say Sarvajama Pratyatya. Would it be a similar a similar process, similar situation here where he explains it so that then he can say that we should um, go beyond it? Your voice wasn't too clear, Madhiji. I couldn't catch everything you said. Uh, it was, I'd heard when, why Krishna explains the Astanga Yoga to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita was because um, he then wanted to say, he wanted to present the different um, forms of religion so that then he could, so that Arjuna had them there and then he could then say, but I would like you to give them up and just surrender unto me. Uh -huh. so is, is it a similar situation here? Well, uh, you mean... Is he presenting the, the, the process of mystic yoga so that he could then explain something in relation to it that's higher? Or oh, that he's already, he's already studied mystic yoga? So then he can go on to something higher. So that when we, when, when, it, yeah. The, so that we can know what we, yeah. If we go straight into bhakti and we, we don't have any experience of the other paths. Mm. Is that your point? Yeah, that, that was how I, I asked the question why Krishna was explaining a Stanga Yoga to Arjuna so that Arjuna knew what the different processes were. So that then when he says Sarvadhamma Pratyaja, he's saying, I want you to give up all of these. And so he should, he should know what he's giving up. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. All right. So, Hare Krishna just... Maharaji. So, yes. uh, in, in uh, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, that is the difference that in Bhagavad Gita, 
Lord consider Arjuna is a ignorant. So first he impart the jnana, and jnana is about this uh, uh, through 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 the knowledge of Atma, then about the Paramatma, and then he moves to the Vijnana. That is about the God realization. That is comes through the Bhakti Mark. But of course, in Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam, straight away in the first two uh, sloka, Lord gives straight away the knowledge about the Vijnana because once for knowledgeable person, if Vijnana is given about the uh, Bhakti Yoga through the realizations of the uh, Lord. Then jnana will come automatically. But here it is probably for for a jnani. So that's why, as uh, uh, Diksha Mataji said, that one has to progress from jnana uh, through uh, to vijnana. And that's why probably uh, 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 Sukhdev Goswami is taking us uh, uh, gradually upward from uh, uh, karmi to uh, 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 karm kan to uh, karmi yog, then niskam karmi yog, uh, jnana yog, dhyana yog, and then finally this bhakti yog. So probably that is the thing. Okay, yes. Some very interesting responses to this. Very nice to hear all your contributions. And I certainly, I think you all have some truth in what you're saying. I, I don't see any anything wrong in your arguments. I think it's good that Arjuna needed to, rather, uh, not Arjuna, but Maharaj Parikshit in this case, he, it's good for him to hear these different processes. So Sukadeva Goswami was describing this meditation on the Virat. Of course, Sukadeva Goswami knew Maharaj Parikshit was a, a devotee, but still he thought it was appropriate to also mention about this uh, or this uh, first stage in realization of the absolute truth. The first step in self-realization, you could say, is to understand the Brahman. So uh, this was one point that. Sukadeva Goswami wanted to go step by step. So begin with, first of all, introducing the concept of the Absolute and the impersonal feature, and then go on to the higher things. Okay, and, and then here's the, another question. That since Maharaj Parikshit was already directly connected with the personal feature of the Lord, why did he inquire about that indirect process? For benefit of others who are Indeed. unable to uh, conceive of the personal feature. Yes, yeah, that's one reason. Anybody else? Is it, is it, would you say the answer to this question is just the same as the answer to the first question? Yes? Anyone? How does this process of meditation constitute the first step in God-realization? How can it bring one closer to Krishna? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Maharaj, when, when you were explaining the Ashtang Yoga, I was thinking about chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So generally uh, what Prabhupada has given us, he made us do all these things, but like we were, we all, we try to sit in a comfortable position at a clean place. We are trying to follow the qualities of a Brahman. So what I feel that this, this is actually when we are, this is actually the first step in God realization when we are chanting the holy names of the Lord. So I connected much to the Ashtanga Yoga and then I realized that this is the first step. Hare Krishna. Okay. And do you feel it brings you closer to Krishna then? 
Yes, Maharaj, very much. Because if we are we are well prepared, then definitely we are ready to do our efforts. And why will Krishna not reveal to him us reveal himself? Okay. Generally, we, we do find that people who have done some meditation and that it's easier for them to take up the chanting of Hare Krishna. They seem to have better control over their minds and they're more able to sit and focus on something, to concentrate. So it, 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 it is a, a valuable process. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. So Maharaj also, like, um, it brings them to a certain level, rather than being a gross materialist, if they are concentrating on uh, the Virat form of the Lord. So at least they are coming to some level of transcendence. And once they are onto the level of transcendence, then they can you know, easily accept their personal form. Their heart is cleansed. They get free from material desires they get purified and so then it is easier for them to accept uh, the holy name well we hope it will be easier yeah i mean <laughs> it, that's the principle anyway that it does help to bring people to krishna consciousness if they get the right association if they get the good association the good guidance then they can be encouraged to uh, go forward from their impersonal meditation to contemplate the personal feature of the Lord. So, those different points are all there for our consideration. All right. What is the benefit of being aware of the universal form. Okay, we have a quote here. This is from the purport, text number 22. We may wonder about the benefit. So, mentioned there, we'll read this purport. These dirty things of fruitive work and empiric philosophy, what we generally refer to as karma, and jnana can be removed only by association with the Supreme Lord. The Lord, being omnipotent, can offer his association by his inconceivable potencies. Thus, persons who are unable to pin their faith on the personal feature of the Absolute are given a chance to associate with his virata roop. Right? They're unable to put their faith on the personal feature. The personal feature means, you know, you show them the deity, we as may we point at this the deities and they, they just what 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 the people are just bewildered sometimes. They have no they don't have the culture, they don't have the background to worship deities. They have no faith in deity worship. And so they lack that kind of faith on the personal feature. So they're given a chance to associate with the Lord through the virata roop or the cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord. The cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord is a feature of his unlimited potencies. Since the potent and potencies are identical, even the conception of his impersonal cosmic feature helps a conditioned soul to associate with the Lord indirectly and thus gradually rise to the stage of personal contact. So Srila Prabhupada brings up the point that the potent and the potencies are identical. So the potent meaning the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself and potencies are His 
his inconceivable energies, his achinchashaktis, his potencies. And so the Lord and his potencies are not different. We cannot separate the sun and the sunlight. The sunlight is the potencies and the sun itself is the potent. And so they're identical. And so in the same way, the conception, this impersonal conception, this cosmic feature, this is for the benefit of the conditioned souls that they can associate with Krishna, they can associate with the Lord indirectly and gradually come to the stage of personal contact. They're associating, they, they learn to see the Lord in the universe. This is a, the pantheistic approach, to see God in everything. Prabhupada mentions here, text 24, a favor to the neophyte. Maybe someone read for us. The Virat Rupa the... manifestation. Sorry, Mataji, please. The Virat Rupa manifestation of the Lord is simultaneously a challenge to the atheist and a favor for the Asuras, who can think of the Lord as Virat and thus gradually cleanse the dirty things from their hearts in order to become qualified to actually see the transcendental form of the Lord in the near future. This is a favor of the all-merciful Lord to the atheists and the gross materialists. So it's a challenge to the atheists and a favor for the asuras that they can learn to think of the Lord. A the atheists, of course, say there's no God. And so, okay, we can say, no, look, here's God. Just see, the world is there. The Lord is there in the form of this world, this whole creation. That is God. And for the Asuras, it's a favor for them. The Asuras want to deny the existence of God, but they can see. how When we explain to them how the Lord is there, the person, the, the features of the universe, how they represent a person, a, de a divine person. And so they can learn to accept this. And by seeing the Lord in the universe, then they can gradually go on to understand that there is a person there's a person there in this world or behind this world. There's a personality. There's a creator behind the creation. So this is a favor of all merciful Lord to these people that they can learn to see him. some quotes here from Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Someone read? Common man who has no love for Krishna cannot always think of Krishna. Therefore, he has to think materially. Because materialists cannot understand Krishna spiritually, they are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see how Krishna is manifested by physical representations. Bhagavad Gita 10, 17 purport. <laughs> of course, people have no love for Krishna, and so they can't think of Krishna, but they can think of the material world. So this is the idea that let people think of the world, but think, try to understand how it relates to the absolute truth. So concentrate the mind on physical things and see how Krishna is there through the physical features of this world. And then? Actually, all such descriptions are for the neophytes. The neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. The material conception of the Lord is now 
not counted in the list of his factual forms. Srimad Bhagavatam 13.304. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada said these descriptions are just for neophytes. Neophytes in the sense that they, they're not able to understand how there's a spiritual energy. They can only see. They say you have to see everything with your eyes. With the, with, you have to see everything. Everything should be visible. We should be able to see it with our eyes. And so we say, all right, so look, you can see the world. You can see the mountains. You can see the rivers. You can see the sun, the moon. You can see it. Oh, so many. Try to understand how these are all representing the actual form of the universe, the form of the Lord, which is in this universe. But this form, this Virata Rup, this is not in the list of his actual forms, his factual forms. It's not one of the forms, it's not one of, it, like, it, you know, the Lord appears in this world in different incarnations, and all of these incarnations, they have their own planets in the spiritual world. Lord Varaha, Lord Nisringadev, Lord Kapila, all of these different forms of the Lord, which he comes in the world, they all have their eternal spiritual planets. But the Virata Rup is not like that. The universal form is a material form, different from that, different from these other forms. Maharaj, the universal form has all the 33 crores of devatas also, it seems like when, uh, he sh when Lord Krishna showed Arjuna the universal form in the 11th chapter, he sees all the 33 crores of devatas. So it could also be a stepping stone for neophyte devotees to get closer to Krishna and have faith in him because they are used to so many demigods uh, being attached to demigods and now uh, they are seeing all the demigods in Krishna and so they feel that's what happened to me basically that's how I became Krishna conscious like I was used to going to different demigod temples and then I was wondering which god should I choose and then one day on the streets of Bombay, I saw the Virat group. And then I thought, I said, all the gods are here in this one form. So I'll buy this. And I took that and I started worshipping the Virat group every day. And then slowly, slowly I became attached to Krishna. That's how it happened to me. But I don't know if that could be a good example. You started worshipping the Virata group and gradually yeah. became attached to Krishna. Yes, yes, that's what, because as a child, I used to go to, on Mon like on Mondays to Lord Shiva temple, on Tuesdays to Devi, Fridays to Devi the temple, and then Saturdays to Hanumanji. On Sundays, I used to go for my ch Sunday school. And uh, like I was doing in general, I used to read Bhagavad Gita, but without understanding, but because my Christian friend used to read Bible every day, I used I thought I also should read, and, and that's how I started reading Bhagavad Gita every day. That's the translation part, not Bhagavad Gita as it is, but of uh, another thing. But then I was wondering, like, which God's name I should chant, like, you know, because Christians have God, but we, don't, like, we have so many gods, so which God to concentrate on one, you know? And that's how, like, when I was passing the streets of Bombay, in the other, like, in Bombay, I used to live there, and I saw that Virat group with all the demigods, you know. Then I thought, okay, Lord Shiva is here, Krishna, everybody is here in this. So if I worship this form of Krishna, like all the gods are there. So I'm worshipping everybody. So everybody is going to be happy. That's what I thought and I started. And then, of course, I was reading Bhagavad Gita also side by side. So slowly, slowly things came to perspective. And, and later on, I came in contact with the devotees and became more clear. Oh, well, very good. Very nice, yes. Nice to know this. Um, <laughs> interesting. Your journey to Krishna yeah. consciousness. Yeah. So, 
I was just thinking that could be also a stepping stone for your bites. To say if you worship Krishna, you're worshiping all the gods automatically. And then that's how even in my preaching, I always say that. See, if you worship Krishna, all the 33 crows of Devatas are a part of Krishna. And that's how he shows it to Arjuna. And so if you're worshiping Krishna, you're worshiping all the gods. So all the gods are automatically happy if you worship Krishna. And they all will bless you. That's what I tell. And all right, we'll just take a break for a few minutes. Let's have, you can have a break because two hours is a long time for you to give all your attention. So we like to give you a break for five minutes. Is that all right? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. That will be good. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so we'll be back in five minutes.
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा महाराज यस ओके सो वी बैक अगेन वी कंटिन्यू हियर वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट how neophytes are materialistic people and they have a difficult time to accept that there's another energy beside the material energy and they don't have a you know you we, we could say they're not very open minded and so they they don't like to accept that there are such things as uh, that, that there is such a thing as spiritual energy so uh this conception of the virata rupa is helpful for them in the beginning to come into krishna consciousness and or to come into the path of self realization and of course for some people they never go any further they simply remain on the platform of worshiping worshiping the universe and seeing the lord in the form of the universe and they're they're actually satisfied with that they don't go on any further so prabhupad explains now about the importance of developing the service attitude this conception of the virata roop conceiving the lord in the form of the universe is only helpful when it, if it comes if it allows you to develop this service attitude and the whole idea is to bring people to the pat platform of devotional service but if if they just simply contemplate the universe then it, it it's not very good it's like two stages of pantheism there's immature and mature the pantheism is immature when they simply see the the, the universe as god but it becomes mature when they learn how to utilize everything in the universe in the service of the supreme everything that we see in the world it actually has some uh, connection to the to the universal form it can be understood to be some kind of limb of the supreme lord but the whole goal of this conception is they they should want to utilize everything in the service of the supreme and if they don't develop that mood of using it for service then it is it's pretty useless if they just simply conceive of the lord as a universe that they won't know how to serve i probably had explained the difference like you worship the universal form you're not going to be able to dress the universal form now how could you dress the universal form how can you worship the universal form but when we see the lord in the form of the deity then it becomes very easy very and it becomes source of pleasure we take a lot of satisfaction in performing deity worship and dressing the deity bathing the deities making flower garlands decorating the altar for the deities it's 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 very satisfying but how do you do these kind of things for the universal form it's very difficult we can simply conceive of the lord in the form of the universe but we want to develop the service attitude so here from text number 26 the purport shrila prabhupad talks about this would someone read for me please the conception of material uh, the conception of the universal form of the lord gives us chance to the materialist to think of the supreme lord but the materialist must know for certain that his visualization of the world in a spirit of lording over it is not god realization the materialistic view of exploitation of the material material resources is occasioned by the illusion of the external energy of the lord and as such if anyone wants to realize the supreme truth by consuming consuming of the universal form of the lord 
he must cultivate the service attitude. Unless the service attitude is revived, the conception of Virat realization will have very little effect on the seer. Thank you, Prabhu. All right, so Prabhupada is describing there people conceiving the universal form of the Lord. They've got to have that service attitude. Of course, that service attitude is there in everyone. We do have that service attitude, but often our service attitude is misdirected. We direct it towards our family, we serve the dog, we serve the country, we serve society, we have a service attitude, but the service attitude is misdirected. We want to direct that service towards the pleasure of the Supreme, for the pleasure of the Absolute Truth. So that we learn from association with devotees. All right, so going on to look at this, how to conceive of this universal form. So here's some of the different examples which are given here by Sukadeva Goswami. From text number 24, this gigantic manifestation of the phenomenal material world as a whole is the personal body of the absolute truth. So time diagrammatically shown there, <laughs> the phenomenal material world. You can see the different elements of the material energy, earth, water, fire, air, ether. And you can see also the soul and super soul diagrammatically shown there in the body, the universal body. And so the different elements of the material world, we could say this is the personal body of the Absolute Truth. And then, persons who have realized it, have studied that the planets known as Patala constitute the bottom of the feet of the Universal Lord, and the heels and the toes are Rasatala planets. The ankles are Mahatala planets, and the shanks constitute the Talatala planets. So these are all different planetary systems in the lower region of the universe. Right? Patala, Rasatala, Mahatala, Talatala, they're all there in the bottom of the universe. They're all in the, the subterranean region of the universe. So they're described to be like the feet and the heels and the shanks and so on, different parts of the, the bottom of the Virata Rup. And then birds are also there. Everything which is in the creation is there within the Virata Rup. So the birds are also there and different varieties of birds, they're an indication of his masterful artistic sense. And you can see the beauty in birds particularly. You can see in the picture here, the swan, how it's very, very artistic, very beautiful. And it's, this is the creation of the Lord. Varieties, so many varieties of birds, of wonderful colors and different features. And they're all indications of the artistic sense which is behind this creation. Then the ocean is like the waste of the universal form, and the hills and mountains are the stacks of his bones. So ocean is a waste, and the hills and mountains, like the bones in the body of the universe. And here, the rivers are like veins of the gigantic body. Trees are the hairs of his body, and the omnipotent air is his breath. So the breath of the Lord, this is air. Clouds which carry water are the hairs on his head. 
The terminations of days or nights are his dress. And the supreme cause of material creation is his intelligence. His mind is the moon, the reservoir of all changes. We know how on a full moon night, many, that a number of people are affected by the full moon. The moon has, has influence over the minds of the living entities. Some people, they go very, almost like mad people whenever there's a full moon. The influence of the moon on the mind. So in the universal form, the mind of the universal form is represented by the moon. And the, the sun is like the eye of the Lord. Different planets are described and diff representing different ways. Brahma is like the intelligence. So, we ask a question to you about this universal form. Is the universal form material, transcendental, or simply imaginary? And we want you to refer to Srila Prabhupada's purport in Bhagavad Gita, 11.5 and 11.45. And what do you learn from these two purports? Can you reconcile these two purports to tell us more about the universal form? Yes? Do you have Bhagavad Gita handy? I want you to check 11.5 purport and 11.45. 11th chapter, of course, the universal form. So Srila Prabhupada speaking there. All right, so what does the 11.5 have to say about the universal form? Although a transcendental form this is, it just manifested for the cosmic manifestation and is therefore subject to the temporary time of the material. So, what can we say about the universal form? from 11.5. For our universal form is material as well as temporary. Okay, but what does 11.45 have to say? And transcendental also provides ideas, although a transcendental form. Hare Krishna Maharaji. So there's uh, 45 says that there are innumerable planets in the sky and each of them Krishna is present by his plenary manifestations by different name. And he also says that this material and temporary 
as the material world is temporary. So what is sowed in a different manifestations in any in virtual form, this is the expansions of the Lord and those are all temporary. So the universal form is what? It is temporary. It is it is the uh, uh, which uh, basically it's it's a is it's a material expansion. So basically, once the annihilation takes place, then that uh, uh, temporary f uh, form is no more existent, no, no more manifest. So it goes under manifestations and unmanifestations, or manifestations and annihilations. While uh, the Lord is always there in his spiritual world, it does not uh, 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 get uh, uh, annihilated. But the material form of the Lord is. Uh, 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 when the material creations happen, it get manifested, and and when the material creations get annihilated, it get unmanifested. Okay, so it's material. Is it also transcendental? In the purpose five, um, purpose five is in the purpose five. That's five. Arjuna wanted to see Krishna in his universal form, which, although a transcendental form, is just manifested for the cosmic manifestation and is therefore subject to the temporary time of the material nature. Though it is a transcendental form, but it's temporary and it is material. So it's transcendental, yes, but it's material. Okay. And then, what about these two purports? Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 3.30 and 2, 5.36. What does Prabhupada say there in the purports? The Prabhupada says, the Virat universal form of the absolute is an imagination of the speculative philosophers unable to adjust the eternal 200 form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form, as imagined by the great philosophers, is one of the features of the Lord, it is more or less imaginary. Okay, so 2536 said it's imaginary. What about 1330? He says that the conception of the Lord known as the Visva Rupa or the Virat Rupa is particularly not mentioned along with the various incarnation of the Lord because all the incarnation of the Lord mentions above are transcendental and there is not a tinge of materialism in their bodies. There is no Difference between the body and this and self as there is in the condition soul. The Virarupa is conceived for those who are just neophyte worshippers. For them, the material Virarupa is presented and it will be explained in the second canto. In the Virarupa, the material manifestation of different planets have been conceived as his legs, hands, etc. Actually, all such descriptions are for neophytes. So those can see only the material aspect of the Rupa in the material world. So is it material or is it transcendental or is it imaginary? All the three. All three. <clears throat> <laughs> As one group say, the conclusion is that, is that the material conception of body of the Lord as Virat is imaginary. 
both the lord and the living beings uh, living spirits and have original spiritual bodies all right hari krishna maharaj ji so that's yeah. the difference between like shankarite philosophy they say that this is a illusion while uh, uh, personal philosophy says that this uh, material universal uh, form that is temporary it is not a illusion so that is real but it is temporary so that is a difference what we draw from the uh, impersonal philosophy or mayavadi philosophy of shankarites and uh, this uh, uh, philosophy of shrimad bhagavatam or bhagavad gita all right so how do we apply this to our understanding of the virata roop so virata roop basically uh, uh, material expansions which is uh, a uh, real but it's temporary and this material expansions itself the entire expansions of this material nature that is uh, the expansions of the lord so this has to be a, 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 the lord body parts only or uh, uh, that way uh, it, it it is temporary but real but at the same time uh, for jiva this they don't have a vision for seeing that virat rupa so they uh, consider that it is a it, it, it is a impersonal uh, but at the same time whatever the material things which you conceive this is this is uh, for for uh, jiva buddh jiva this is a, a, a real so overall conclusion we can have that this is a temporary from the spiritual point of view but for uh, jiva buddh jiva uh, 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 this, uh, this is uh, real but in no cases we can consider that it is a imaginary Well, Srila Prabhupada did seem to comment that it's an imaginary form, that there is no form, but it's simply uh, in, within the imagination we, um, we put these parts together into a form, but there's no factual form, it's simply the, the form which we put together, we, we, you know, we make up that form with the power of our own minds. but not that there's it is a, is is a actually any factual form of the virata roop no yeah prupa it's a mark prupa compare here how we as a living entity having a material form uh the same way prupa says that the same way that the, the uh super soul is as a imaginarily we are, we are giving the form in the material concept so i think that's what propa is trying to say the present form of the conditioned soul are also not factual so the, the same thing was applied to the virat rupa as love how we our form are not factual we have our spiritual form and in, in the same way propa says that 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 the, this is the, the virat the conception of the body of the lord as virat is imaginary like is temporary and imaginary this is what i can see from here much the purport yes certainly <laughs> certainly confusing how to conceive of this virata roop well, there did some material uh, material elements and it's also it's certainly transcendental because we, we're describing the absolute the, the form of the lord and is he actually real or is it imaginary is there any actual form well <laughs> difficult to draw the conclusion of the... yes yes uh, in 115 bhagavad gita flat uh, upa says though it is transcendental but it is temporary it is imaginary so without the touch of the transcendence there cannot be any uh, material the matter comes from the spirit so though it is temporary imaginary but there must be a person behind all this and that person must be transcendent so lord yes. form also is transcendent the flat robust purpose so the universal form is material it's transcendental 
And we can also say to some extent it's also imaginary. It's certainly not spiritual form, it's material form. And but the, and because it is the universal form, it's a representation of the so it is also transcendental. And as far as it being actual a re, an actual form, is there any actual factual form there or are we simply imagining it? There's certainly there's some imagination there putting the form together. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, yes. but, uh, in, when Arjuna uh, uh, showing the Lord form and that's the time uh, Lord has given him a, a spiritual eye and shows this Virat Rupa. And, and whatever way the Virat Rupa which has been perceived by Arjuna, that is what it is presented in uh, Bhagavad Gita and that is what we are trying to perceive in Srimad Bhagavatam also. So if Arjuna with uh, this uh, spiritual eye, what he has perceived and he perceived uh, a, 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 he, he perceived a, a figure, it was not a, so how we can say that uh, what Arjuna has perceived with the spiritual power which has been rendered to Arjuna by the Lord himself can be a imaginary well, what Arjuna saw, that was a special form of the, a special feature. That was a general, what Arjuna saw is the Kala Roop, the form of time. What Arjuna saw is something, it's not that there's only one universal form. You know, we don't read about Arjuna seeing all these different mountains and rivers and planets and so on. What did Arjuna see? Arjuna saw the different sons of Duryodhan, uh, different sons of Dhritarashtra all entering into the mouths and being crushed. He, Arjuna saw, you know, the, the Kala Rup, the form of time. And then he, he saw the devastation which was going to come as a result of the Kurukshetra war. So what Arjuna saw was something very special. And, so, and, Raji, that Kala Rupa has been shown at a later stage, but before that, it showed the Virat Rupa, where the whole universe is uh, part and partial of him, and even there, he can see that uh, uh, himself and, and and the Lord and the chariot, uh, and at the same way, uh, Lord showed the entire universe in his mouth to uh, Yashoda Mata. Uh, at a couple of times, so uh, so when Lord, because uh, Shoda Mata sees, uh, definitely is uh, sees the uh, eternal associate of the Lord, so there the effect of Maya Devi cannot be there, and Lord is showing everything in his in his mouth. So how can uh, can that be imaginary? That has to be have, have some some reality. So you're saying we're all in the mouth of the Lord? Yes, Maharaj. So basically when he is showing this, uh, uh, this universal or his Virat rule, then uh, it, it, and as such uh, the whole material creation, it, 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 it's the external potency of the Lord. So it's expansions of the Lord. So when Lord expand in his Prakash or Vilas Rup. So, the, the, so like that, there is a, it's a Lord expansion uh, in, in Virat Rup, and that is his external energy. That's a material expansion. So that also have a some kind of a, 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 a personal feature, which uh, uh, normally uh, the feature what we uh, see of the Lord in his spiritual abode as a personal feature. So, uh, so how we can say, and that is the difference between. Uh, there's a, a Mayavadi philosophy and uh, personal philosophy that they consider it is uh, 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 illusory. Why, why, while personal philosophy, we say that this is a, a, a real but temporary. Well, we're not saying we're not saying the world is illusory. We're not saying the world is imagination. But we're simply saying that, that, that there's a combination of all the different elements of the creation to put them all together into a form, 
were saying, well, that's uh, some kind of uh, imagery to put all the different parts together. Is it is it, is it actually such a form? And do all the parts actually come from that form? Anyway, it, certainly we could we could go on debating about this, and there does seem to be some conflicting statements by Prabhupada about this. Uh, he says different things in different places. Let's read a bit more first. So here, what is the universal form? The Supreme Personality of Godhead by his partial representation, measuring not more than nine inches as super soul, expands by his potential energy in the shape of the universal form which includes everything manifested in different varieties of organic and inorganic materials. So the universal form is the expansion of the super soul, right? Mentioned here, the super soul expands in the form of the universal form. So that universal form is the expansion of the super soul. And the super soul is only described to be nine inches in the heart of the living entities. And this universal form includes everything, everything manifested, organic and inorganic materials. So it's all there within the universal form. Uh, uh, uh. Prabhu, I'm just giving class just now, Prabhu. Okay. Not sure the Not sure the Not sure the Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay. Sorry. Uh. Yes, Maharaj. I know in Bhagavad Gita says that, and even in the Brahm Sahita, that uh, uh, Lord enters uh, even in the all. Uh, the atom uh, and 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 in in Pramatma form that super soul form. So even the atoms and even the finest of the atom and uh, many places it is compared the size of the soul and super soul is almost the same. And there it is considered one uh, uh, one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. So and here we are seeing that nine inches. How do we understand the size of the super soul? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question, right? <laughs> yeah, nine inches here, yeah, nine inches, and how, how the, the, the one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. Well, no, the super soul is described like that, that measuring not more than not more than nine inches. It will depend, of course, on the body of the particular living entity. It's not going to be the same for everyone, but in proportion to the body. In other places, sometimes it's described that the super soul is the size of the thumb. Yeah. And so, uh, but I don't know where it says the soul and the super soul are the same size. I never saw that before. Where did you get that from? In, in Brahm Sahita say that Lord enters in every atoms and aspects of the universe and atoms are very, very uh, tiny. Uh, so, so it is understood that if it is some uh, Lord is entering even the tiniest of the tiny particle, then size has to be very, very minuscule. Well, he, I said he's going to, the super soul is going to adjust according to the situation. Of course, it's not going to be in every atom that is nine inches, but it's, it's mentioned here, no more than nine inches. 
and he expands in the shape of the universal form. The point is the universal form is the expansion of the super soul. So is this universal form real or imaginary? This was the conflict we are having. Let's read these different quotes here, which we have, first of all, from 2536. The Virata universal form of, that, of the Absolute is an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are unable to adjust to the, to the eternal two-handed form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form, as imagined by the great philosophers, is one of the features of the Lord, it is more or less imaginary. And then, from third canto, chapter 6, verse 4, the Virata Rup is not, therefore, an eternal form of the Lord exhibited in the spiritual sky. It is a material manifestation of the Lord. The Archavigraha, or the worshipable deity in the temple, is a similar manifestation of the Lord for the neophytes. But in spite of their material touch, such forms of the Lord as the Virat and Archa are all non-different from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. All right, so uh, certainly these forms are very helpful. That's the main point we want to understand. You know, we could debate whether it's imaginary or not. It's a question of what is imaginary and what's not, you see. But uh, anyway, the, the, the main point is that contemplating these forms is certainly helpful for people to understand the, the personality of Godhead and to bring them to devotional service. They're an advantage for the neophytes. Another statement here from 11th Canto, 3rd Chapter, Text 12. It is merely the temporary imaginary resemblance of his personal form within the kingdom of Maya. In the 1st Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, as well as in the second canto, the universal form of the Lord is clearly explained to be an imaginary form offered to the neophyte for meditation on God. And then from 11th canto also, 5th chapter, text number 2, similarly, the Virata Rup, a universal form of the Lord is an imaginary form meant to help the gross materialist gradually under. So, these are some statements from Srimad Bhagavatam. And just to go ahead here. The form seen by Arjuna is a manifestation by Krishna's internal potency. This form, or the form, is contained within Krishna's two-armed form. So the form seen by Arjuna is Krishna's internal potency. It's not material, in other words, it's a spiritual form. Arjuna actually saw the spiritual form. And that form is contained within Krishna's two-armed form. Now, I have to point out some of these, not all of these quotes are coming from Srila Prabhupada. This one, for example, is from Surrender Unto Me by Burijan Prabhu, 
And the quotes from the 11th canto, 11th canto is compiled by Ridayananda Goswami along with Gopi Paranadana Prabhu. So, <laughs> you know, you, you get different opinions, different people, different things. I'm sure this uh, statement here from Surrenderan to me must be coming from the Acharyas. Buridan Prabhu is giving us some statement taken from some other Acharyas here. But that Virata Rup, which Arjuna saw, that is the internal potency and that is contained within Krishna's two arm form, which is his original transcendental form. Only the pure devotees can see that form. What form? That virata rup. That it's only seen by the pure devotees. A devotee is not much interested in the universal form because it does not enable one to reciprocate loving feelings. So that, that's an important point there at the end. And that's from Srila Prabhupada. These two are, are from Srila Prabhupada, from the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada saying that this universal form is not very important for the devotees because we're not able to show our love for that universal form so easily. When Arjuna saw the universal form, he was filled with awe and veneration but he didn't feel an awakening of devotion. And it's devotion, the mood of devotion, which we want to cultivate. Those who are impersonalists are also imagining that they are seeing the universal form of the Lord. But from Bhagavad Gita, we understand that the impersonalists are not devotees. Therefore, they are unable to see the universal form of the Lord. From Bhagavad Gita 11.48. So the impersonalists imagine they're seeing the universal form. So it, 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 for them it's an imagination because they're not actually able to see the universal form because they are not devotees. And without being devotees, they cannot see that form. So I think that's a good point to note, that other people who think they're seeing the form, it's just they're imagining it. It's not true because they're not actually devotees. They're not pure devotees. It's only for the pure devotees who can actually see this form. His Virata Rup exists and is all-pervading. However, the Lord shows that form only to whom he chooses. And so on that basis, Prabhu, yeah, we would accept that the form of the Lord is not imaginary, <laughs> but uh, for the impersonalists, what they think they're seeing, that is imagination. The Lord only shows that form to the devotees who he uses. Uh, and some more points. The universal form is also considered personal, though not human. So there's a conversation here. Malati was one of the uh, very early devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement. So she had a lot of association with Prabhupada. And this is one conversation which was recorded. So she said, what class of impersonalists are worshipping the universal form? And Prabhupada says, well, universal form is not impersonal. That is personal. That is also manifested. That is also a manifestation of Krishna. And Malati said, but you say that in one of your purports, you are saying that the impersonalists are worshipping the universal form. And Prabhupada said, 
they are advised. And Sham Sundar said, ah, advised to worship. <laughs> In other words, the impersonalists are not actually worshipping the universal form, but they're advised to worship it. Is it clear? The universal form is not impersonal. It is, it is personal. It's Krishna. And uh, how a devotee sees creation for our personal contemplation. Stavara Jagama Deki Nadeki Tara Murti Sarvatrahaya Nija Nripa Devasputi. The advanced devotee certainly sees everything, mobile and immobile but he does not exactly see their forms. Rather, everywhere he immediately sees manifest the form of the Supreme Lord. This is the vision of the Uttama Adhikari. Doesn't directly, does not exactly see their forms. Everywhere he sees Krishna, he sees the form of Krishna every, in everything. All right, so here we will just review what we've been covering today. We hope you can understand some of, understanding, first of all, the, the progression of Sukadev's instruction. Why is he describing Bhakti Mishra Yoga? with meditation on the Virat at, as its beginning stages. Why is Parikshit interested in hearing it? So we did speak about this. Uh, why is Sukadeva, Sukadeva Goswami beginning his instructions in this way? Well, he wants to explain this meditation from the beginning introducing the concept of the Brahman. If he would immediately go to the personal feature of the Lord, then it would be much more difficult for people to understand. So he's bringing us progressively to a higher understanding. Just like we heard from the Bhagavad Gita, the yoga ladder, and so similarly, Sukadeva Goswami is beginning the first steps of self-realization. And the first step of self-realization is to understand how everything represents the Lord. Everything is the energy of the Lord. And, the, and the, within this universe, there's also, there's a form, there is a, the, personal form of the Lord there within the universe. And Maharaj Parikshit is interested in hearing it. He's interested in, in hearing it because he has, he, he wants to know everything about the Lord. Just like one who does bhakti yoga, he should know about all the other yogas which are preliminary to bhakti. It's not that we could just say, oh, I just do bhakti, I only know about bhakti. We should also know about the, the preliminary stages of yoga. So similarly, realizing the Lord, we should realize the, all the features of the Lord. We should understand his per, the personal and the impersonal features. Although Prabhupada was saying, actually, this is personal, and the Virata Rupa is personal. All right, then we spoke about the main features of the universal form, the main features, for example, how the different planets represent different parts of the body of the Lord. You have the uh, Patala and Talatala and Pat. Uh, Palatala, Patala, Sutala, all these planets at the bottom of the universe, they represent the 
the soles and the heels and the shanks of the universal form. And the top, the upper planets in the universe, like Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and Patalo, uh, Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and uh, Mahaloka and Janaloka, they're all representing the head of the Lord, and then you've got the Satyaloka at the very top. A such a look is actually the head, and then one one is the neck, and one is the the mouth, one is the forehead, different parts of the universal body of the Lord. We heard how the uh, rivers are the veins, the sun is like the eye, the moon is the mind. Everything which is in the universe is represented in the universal form. The brahmanas are like the head. And the Kshatriyas are the arms, the Vaishya, the belly, the Sudras, the legs. So all different things, everything organic and inorganic, it's all represented by some different limb or different organ of the universal form of the Lord, the Virataru. These are the main features of the universal form. And the, the importance of developing service attitude and respect for God's creation as opposed to the exploiting mentality typical of conditioned souls. So this is the idea and in contemplating the universal form, we should understand that everything in this creation is actually the property of the the supreme it's not it's not just there simply for our exploitation but everything which is there is there for a purpose and it has there's some reason for it being there and it, it's not there just simply for our own enjoyment it's not just there for our sense gratification so we have to have respect for the lord's creation a devotee will certain, certainly be respectful to all forms of life. And he'll be very careful also about the, the different energies of the Lord. We don't want to waste anything. The lifestyle of the devotee will be based on simple living and high thinking. And he will minimize the bodily demands because he will respect everything as being the property of the Supreme Lord, and where it's allowed for us to take what we need and not to take more. We don't want to destroy the world. The world is not there for us to destroy. We take what we need, don't take more. So that's the principle, living in the world. And then the benefits of meditating on the universal form for those unable to appreciate Krishna's personal form. So the benefit is that by meditating on the universal form, they will gradually become purified to understand that we are not the Supreme and the world is not there just simply for our enjoyment, but we're meant to be the servant and that contemplating the universal form will help us to understand our insignificant position in this universe and help us to develop a service attitude and understand that that universal form has also a personal feature and that personal form is actually Lord Sri Krishna and that universal form is simply the expansion of his expansion. Right? The Paramatma expands as a super soul, and the Paramatma is an expansion of Krishna. So the original form of Godhead is Lord Sri Krishna. So that can be understood gradually, and by meditating on the universal form, we can come to accept the personal form of the Lord. And then the nature of the universal form as temporary, but transcendentally surcharged personal manifestation of Krishna. 
All right, the form is certainly temporary, but at the same time, it's transcendental. All right, are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu? Maraj, yes, Maharaj? Well, who is this? Yes, somebody has their hand up, have a question there, Prabhu? Yeah, um, it's uh, Vishnu, Vishnu, what is it? Vishnu Kanta. Is it like that the form Arjuna saw, it It was personal and the, the form... Not audible, Mataji. Hey, why is it audible? Maharaj is it audible now, Prabhuji? Oh. Hare Krishna? Audible. No. Prabhuji, Maharaj, I am asking, is it like uh, the form which Arjuna saw, uh, Lord Krishna saw, showed it to Arjuna, Is uh, it was uh, personal, but the form which we read in Bhagavatam, it is imaginary or both the both forms are same maraj well first of all krishna showed the form to arjuna <coughs> you're saying arjuna showed the form to krishna <coughs> maraj krishna showed to the form that krishna showed to the arjuna the form that krishna showed to arjuna what's your question about it that form is personal, but the form which we read in Srimad Bhagavatam, like uh, mountains are his bones and all, is it imaginary or is it also uh, personal? Yes, Prabhupada said it's personal. Right, when his conversation with Malati, he brought out that point. He said that it, it's personal, it's Krishna. It's a form of a form of Krishna from the material elements. Both the forms are same. The, these are two not different things. Like it is same. What the form of Krishna, the trend, the the, the the divine form of Krishna and the Virata Rup. Yes, Maharaj, which we read in Srimad Bhagavatam and that form that Krishna showed to Arjuna. Well, the form which Krishna showed to Arjuna, we are told, we just read, that was the internal potency. That was the internal potency of Krishna. And that is only seen by pure devotees. Yes, Maharaj, but that form, we, this about Virat Roop, everyone can see mountains and rivers. So... How can I'm not able to understand how it is personal form? You want to understand how the Virata Rup is a personal form? Yes, Maharaj. Well, Srila Prabhupada said it's not different from Krishna. But he mentioned the potent and the potency is not different. The potent and the potency. The potent Lord Krishna and his potency. The Virata Rup, the universal form, they're not different. They're one and at the same time different. No. They're different and they're not different. Okay. This is Lord Chaitanya's philosophy, Achintya Beda, Beda Tattva. Everything is one with Krishna and at the same time different from him. So the Virata Rup is Krishna, but at the same time it's different from Krishna. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaji. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, my understanding was that I saw is perceived differently to the different people. So the Lord also perceives differently to the different categories of people, depending upon their faith. Archa Vigraha and the Vira Matta Paratarangna Anyat Kinchid Asti Dhananja 
that may be spiritual, imaginary, material, personal, whatever the forms may be, that all is under the control of Krishna. Matta Parataram Nanyat. So everything is coming from Krishna, but differently is perceived to the different types of people. Like Archa and Birat, those both are transcendental, but differently perceived to the different types of people. So it was my understanding. Please correct me. No, I think everything is said is all right. Yes. Different people who see the Lord in different ways. Some people they will worship the Lord in the Archa Vigraha and other people they'll worship the Lord in the Virata Rup. So Krishna reveals himself different ways to different people. Yes. For some people they can conceive of the Lord in the form of the impersonal Brahman. And other people they conceive of the Lord and such the Nanda Vigraha. Thank you. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I wanted to ask that uh, regarding the service attitude, like how how is it relevant in this context, importance of developing service attitude? In the context we were reading of the impersonal regarding the reading of creation and in this topic how is it like relevant i could relate it well service attitude is very important because without the service attitude we simply become impersonal and the impersonalist desires to become the supreme he's thinking himself to be god he wants to merge with God. And so that way it's very important. We don't want to become impersonal and to develop the idea that we are the supreme, that we're one with God, we are the controller. That, that will be very bad for us. But the mood of service attitude is very essential because it will allow us to work together and to live in harmony with the world to live in harmony with nature and with each other if we have the mood of being servants. But if we have the mood of being God, then simply there will be quarrel and arguing. So in order to have peace in the world, it's essential. Thank you so much, Maharaj. And Maharaj, I wanted to ask that, is universal form imaginary? In case of imagination means like, we see all the mountains, rivers, so how uh, is universal form imaginary? Or is it yeah. real? No, okay, the universal form is real, but what people think they're seeing, when people think they're seeing the universal form, that is imaginary. Unless they're actually pure devotees. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, if you can just conclude on this is universal form, material, transcendental, or simply imaginary, because we are reading so much, all everything is mixed up in the mind. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm basing it on Prabhupada's words there, which Prabhupada said there at the end, you know. He, he, he said, for the impersonalist, their contemplation of the universal form is imaginary. Those persons who think they're actually seeing the universal form, it's an, they, they imagine they're seeing it. Because in order to actually see the universal form, you must be pure devotee. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. So Arjuna, he could see the universal form by the grace of Krishna. Without the grace of Krishna, we have no right to see the universal form. So it's not just, you know, if, you, if you, we hear about all oh, the veins and the trees and this and that, and we imagine the universal form. That's imagination, that we put it together in our own mind. You know, we imagine. <laughs> the universal form. So we're not actually seeing the universal form. We're imagining it. 
with the power of our own mind. So that, that is imagination. But to actually see the universal form, it's not imagination. It, it, there is such a thing. But it's the internal energy of Lord Krishna. It's spiritual energy. And you can only see it by the grace of Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, can we also understand this in a way like, for example, if we imagine that, uh, you know, in our imaginations, if we are uh, meeting Srila Prabhupada and we are trying to serve Srila Prabhupada personally like that. So now that thought is an imagination, but it is not an illusion. It is still a transcendental imagination. So like that, if we are thinking of a universal form to be the body of Krishna, so that thought brings us closer to Krishna. So it is an imagination, but it is not an illusion. It is bringing us closer to Krishna. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes, good. Yeah, that's a nice example. It's Thank bringing you to Krishna. Yes. Okay, any other points? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. It was a wonderful session. This was so... Uh, uh, so uh, we were able to think so much about all these things. I had never thought about material, transcendental, imaginary words, how you put together all the words of Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Okay. So we'll leave it with you for a week to think on, to ponder over. <laughs> And we'll be back on Friday. So take care. Have a good week. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.